So planning for election day. So there's, you know, to be honest, when I started making this presentation, you know, it occurred to me there's about 101 things that need to go on in order to truly plan for election day. And we're obviously not going to cover all of those things. Um, so I'm trying to highlight on some of the, the big ones that, in my experience, green candidates have, um, you know, done either done well or have been missed opportunities that I wish Green Party candidates had done better with. Um, so the overview tonight is we're going we're gonna to talk about how you prepare to have an effective presence at the polls. We're going to talk about uh, material and distribution strategies, how to talk to potential voters. We're going to talk a little bit about targeting constituencies. Um, there's been a whole, we have a whole other call that we did just on targeting that I can refer folks to. Um, so we're not going to cover that too much. Um, and we're going to talk about how to use, utilize volunteers effectively in these last few weeks of the campaign. Um, so just to jump right in, and, and you know, in some ways it's actually good that a lot of you all are from the Northeast. I think one of the things that I've learned, um, having been active now at the national level in the Green Party, is that if you know how something's done in one state, you know how something's done in one state. Um, and so, you know, we really do have a federal system when it comes to elections. The way things work in Pennsylvania is not the way things work in Georgia or Massachusetts or Illinois. And so I will admit that my presentation really is coming from my perspective, having done worked elections for 18 years in Philadelphia and in the Northeast which can be very different in other parts of the country. And so one of the things that will become most apparent, so here in Philly and Pennsylvania, we don't have early voting. Um, there's basically election day and that's it. And so a lot of what I'm going to talk about and sort of my frame of reference when I think about planning for election day is planning for one specific day. Where, and I'm fully aware that in other parts of the country where early voting might be a big deal, um, what I'm about to say may just not apply, or may, you might have to sort of transform it and um, put it into your own context. So that's like big disclaimer that I just wanted to put out there. Um, and certainly if anybody is from a place where they have early voting or other kinds of things that affect um, the gist of what I'm saying, I would love to hear, like chime in and tell us how it makes things different for you. All right, so the overview at this point in the year is, you know, is I'm going to talk about what's on the left, the planning for Election Day, which is basically roughly now until, let's say, October 30th. October, the last few days of the campaign, October, let's say October 31st to November 5th, that is your get out the vote period. And the way you behave <laughs> and get out the vote is a little different than the way you're behaving now when you're in sort of regular campaign mode. Um, or at least it should be, and we do have another call for next month on Get Out the Vote. And then November 6th this year is the actual election day, and that's a different set of activities. So tonight's call is really going to focus on that first bucket, planning for election day. Um, so the big, this is the upshot, work with the end in mind, right? And so if, in my experience, again, coming from, you know, a state with no early voting, Election day is a big deal, right? It's obviously, I mean, that can't be understated, right? It's the thing that we're working up to, right? Um, but for many Green Party candidates, particularly down ballot races, but even, you know, up ticket races, we just simply haven't had the budget and the exposure for people to often, like a lot of times people walk into the voting booth and learn about the Green Party being on the ballot for the first time right then and there, um, which is obviously not a great thing. But at the same time, there, there is some advantage there in that people are, are sometimes still open to hearing about Green Party candidates, even as late as Election Day itself. And so one of the things that we have found in Philadelphia, and we have numbers and data to back this up, is that where we have people – who are working the polls, and I, what, by that I mean basically standing outside the polling place on election day as long as possible, all day if possible, handing out materials as people walk in, say like, hey, vote for Joe, consider a vote for Joe, can I get a vote for Joe, that our numbers in those locations 
is significantly better than in places where we didn't put people. And so here we have really tried to make it a big deal to be out on election day and to make sure that we have our polls covered. So this is about working with that end in mind and trying to maximize your vote turnout on November 6th, which is at some point the ultimate goal here. So for election day itself, we're talking like there's a polling place strategy. And that's mapping out your district by polling place. Um, for some districts, that's going to be a very, like for a small local race, that might only be a couple of places. Um, you know, if you're running for Congress or Senate or Neil, who's running statewide, it's going to be thousands. Um, here in Philadelphia, just in the city of Philadelphia, which is obviously a big city, but still it's one city, there are 1,600 and change um, polling places throughout the city. So it's a very small territory, five city blocks, or not even all vote, like a thousand people basically vote in one polling place. Um, obviously in other parts of the country it's gonna be different, but our experience across the board is that the more people you have in polling places connecting with voters on election day, the better you will do in that race. <coughs> So the goal is to have a volunteer at each and every polling place. That it might be impossible given the size and scale of your district, but you know the goal is to have as many as possible. Um, and in addition to an actual person, of course you want signage. You're going to want pamphlets. What are, you know when that person hands you something? Like what are they handing you? They've got to be handing you something. That is material that needs to get designed and printed and distributed. Um, and so. You know, you really want to sit there and backwards map, like get the list of polling places, whether you get that from your county board of election or your state you know, department. Um, you, you know, are going to seek volunteers. You're going to place them. Are they going to be close to home, ideally? Um, you know, depending on where your, your, um, your race is, you know, people might be coming from all over the region to focus on one small district, or you, if you're doing statewide or, or some other large territory, people might be able to just stay where they're at because you know where they're at covers an entire district, um, or as part, you know, your district covers where everyone might be coming from. Um, and then you also really need to think about like how are you going to get all that material out to people. Um, and really thinking about that, you know, are people coming to one central place to pick it up? Is it printed in time? Are there captains who are distributing stuff to their territories? All of that kind of stuff. Um, and then because you likely have limited resources, um, you really got to think about focusing. You know, if you can't do your entire district, you know, Neil is not going to be able to cover his entire state of Pennsylvania. It's a huge territory. And so, you know, are there places that he wants to try to target because for whatever reason we think they might have a higher green turnout. They might be better poised for us than other places. Now, I say that on the assumption that your goal is to win and to capture as many votes as possible, which is traditionally what it's about. However, it's also perfectly legitimate to have the goal for your race to be something different, like building the Green Party, um, because the likelihood of you winning statewide office at this point um, is probably small. And so maybe your goal is something different, and it's about exposure for the Green Party, exposure for a particular issue, and instead of necessarily targeting the places that already vote, that, you know, have the best votes for Greens, Maybe you want to go in the opposite direction and target the places where we've had the least penetration. Um, so in some ways, it doesn't matter what your goal is, um, but think about what your goal is and then use that goal to help you figure out wh which areas in your district you want to target on the assumption that you don't have the bandwidth to quite cover everything. Um, let me stop there, and I'm going to ask if there's any questions at this point or comments. And if you're on mute, feel free to take yourself off. <coughs> okay. All right, moving on. All right, so the other thing to think about is like, what is the candidate going to do on election day? Um, and so 
I've worked on campaigns where the candidate basically is one of the poll, polling volunteers. Um, you know, like we don't have as many people as we need, and the candidate themselves just sort of plunks in and does the work that everyone else does. Um, it's nice if you can, if the candidate can have a different kind of experience on election day. Um, if you've been running a serious, hard-fought campaign, you are going to be all keyed up and crazy pants on election day. Like I have seen it, um, and it's really hard. You know, you're just like, you know a deer in headlights, um, you know, and just feeling jittery and like on the, in the spotlight the whole day. And so it would be, it's really great if the candidate has a handler, some person who just accompanies the candidate all day long and just makes sure that they're not, you know, biting off all their fingernails, put it, pasting a, floor, you know, a hole in the floor or whatever, um, annoying everyone else around them, whatever the case may be, just keeps them focused and keeps them positive and energized. Um, you know, the candidate can be still meeting and greeting potential voters, even on election day, um, and especially meeting and greeting volunteers. And so, you know, one of the nice things for a candidate to do is just simply drive around the district and pop in and all those polling places, say hi to the volunteers, thank you for doing this. You know, you can still chit-chat with some, you know, potential voters. Hey, have you voted yet? All that kind of stuff. <clears throat> I've worked with candidates who have done press conferences on Election Day. Um, you know, everything from the, you know, really traditional, like, and you see this on TV during the presidential year, right? Like, here is, you know, Joe going into his own polling place on Tuesday morning and voting for himself, right? You know, the media may not come to something if you're a small candidate running for a small office, but, you know, you can still put out press releases. You can do all that same stuff that you've been doing. You know, it doesn't stop on Election Day. Um, and it, I've also seen more serious things. So I've worked on Sherry Honkala's campaign, who was running in a special election two years ago, and we felt that there was all kinds of issues of voter fraud and intimidation. And we held a press conference at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on Election Day. You know, like we saw what was going on and we were like, hey, this is garbage. So, um, you know, you might also want to be prepared for any kind of random weird things that go on um, and, and use the media if you can to highlight, to highlight that. Um, you know, yeah, talked about the media event around the candidate themselves voting. Um, another fun thing that I've, I haven't seen this a lot, but we did it, I think we did it one time. And again, this works more maybe in cities where it's dense, but, you know, what's called a sound car is basically you wire up a car with speakers or a bullhorn, and you just sort of drive around, you know, saying, hey, today's election day, go vote for Hillary Kane for city council, or whatever the case may be. Um, sort of drumming up support and just making sure people are aware that today is election day. Um, and that's something that the candidate could also be a part of. Um, election night, don't forget about it. So um, people need to have some sort of celebratory culminating event, you know, for what that has been maybe a marathon run all year long or really what's been a really, really long <laughs> sprint. <clears throat> it doesn't have to be fancy, um, but you really should have some kind of gathering or party for your volunteers and your key supporters. You know, some type of, you know, whether it's at your house, if there's, you have a campaign headquarters or some place that you're like, you've made the headquarters for the day, um, you know, get some pizza at the end of the night, get somebody to bring some beer, like it can be really informal, but people – often want a place to gather and talk about their experiences for the day, what it was like, how they feel it was going, did, was turnout high, was turnout low, did people take their stuff, did they not? Um, you know, you guys have been working hard all year long, and people want to be to blow off some steam and just celebrate together. So um, I really can't over – like, it, it is important to just have these kinds of things um, and to give people that really that good sense of camaraderie and that sense of um, you know I was part of this large thing larger than myself 
And even if you're not winning, like it doesn't have to be a victory party, but you can celebrate the victory uh, and the accomplishments that you had because maybe you brought in more votes than any other green before you, or maybe you ran as a green for the first time in your district, or some other thing that you accomplished that hadn't been done before. Um, so definitely consider, you know, and this is a good task for a volunteer, maybe someone who can't, isn't good or isn't available to door knock during the day or make phone calls, but, you know, they are, they've got that, you know, event planning thing going down. Um, so one other thing that sometimes is common, again, you know, with old, maybe old school style machine politics is literally getting the count from the machines at the end of the night. And so here in Philly, like, we can, the polls close at 8 p.m. By 8.20, you know, they spit out the register tape, and it has the totals for that particular machine and polling place, and they usually will give extra copies to folks who are hanging around and are representing the candidates in the campaign. And so a really well-organized campaign will be gathering all that stuff back at campaign headquarters and sort of tallying up and kind of figuring out themselves what, instead of like hitting a refresh on the Department of State website, you know, till all hours of the night as stuff slowly trickles in. Um, and that might be for, again, a, maybe a, a more local campaign where, you know, you've got deeper coverage of your territory. Um, and then, of course, you should be checking in with the CCC because we have often, and I don't know what we're going to do this year, but we've often done some kind of live Facebook event where we then sort of check in with candidates around the country um, and hear their thoughts on the day and the race and, and all that jazz. Um, so I think that's it as far as my like actual election day slash election night conversation goes. And then I think I want to shift more into the things that you can be doing now to lead up to that night, not just in the planning of the, of the day and the night, but sort of the ongoing campaign work. So again, I want to pause and see if people have questions or comments about this stuff so far. You're doing a great job. Keep rolling. All right. Great. Okay. So moving on. So let's talk a little bit about printed materials. So switching focus. Um, so it's not just on Election Day, but from now until Election Day, and hopefully you've already been doing this, you need to be putting stuff in people's hands to tell them about who you are and what you stand for and what this whole election thing is about. And so, you know, don't forget that just because you're super politically active and you're an elections nerd and you know that Election Day is coming – um, a lot of people don't, you know, like our, the, the voter turnout rate in this country is not so hot. Like more people are way more interested in American Idol, um, even though it's been on for God knows how long and probably is not what it used to be. Um, you know, like people, there's a lot of stuff out there distracting us. And so even in, you know, it's midterms, you know, depending on your state, there may or may not be a hot governor race or a hot Senate race. It's possible that neither one is happening. Um, you know, if you're running for something like really down ballot, people just aren't necessarily paying attention. And so you've got to let them know. Um, and so you've got to, in most cases, and there's all kinds of ways you're going to let them know, but one effective way is to, you know, print stuff up and hand it out. So what are the kinds of things that we can print out? So a big one is signs. Um, lawn signs, you know, for people's yards. Um, houses and windows, storefronts, you know, prominent roads. And please, of course, my Green Party public service announcement is after Election Day, go back and clean all that stuff up, right? Like, we don't want to be the polluters <laughs> who are leaving our crap all over. Um, <clears throat> please don't staple into trees. <laughs> um, so we, we should all know that. But um, there's all kinds of signs out there. I am by no means the expert in print shops and what these kinds of things cost and, and where to get them. I know a couple other people on our committee are. And hopefully, if you haven't figured this all out already for your campaign, there's other people who have been there, done that before you in your state or your local. And if not, we can connect you to those resources nationally. 
Um, you want to think about door knockers. So these are the kinds of things that um, <clears throat> are typically, I don't know, about like say if a third of a piece of paper. Um, so if you had like a piece of paper landscape and you cut it in thirds, and then they have like literally a cutout um, and um, a tear so that you can like hang it over someone's front door, um, the front doorknob. Um, and those are obviously used for door-to-door -door canvassing. Um, you, there's direct mail, which most people don't do because it's kind of expensive um, and hard to pull off, but it is still a thing. Um, you're obviously going to see that and probably have received all kind of direct mail pieces from mainstream main party candidates. Um, leaflets, you know, it's kind of like the door knockers, but maybe without the hole. Um, and so handing things out at events, tabling, um, you know, farmers markets, you know, this time of the year, there's all kinds of, you know, still outdoorsy things. As the weather has, is changing, but it, in many, most places it hasn't fully changed yet, and people are still outside enjoying the weather. Go to where those places are um, and get, get your stuff out. Um, all right, so that's one, you know, the just different types of printed materials. <coughs> um, things to consider. Um, there are no rules about this, but traditionally, at least in the Green Party world that I'm familiar with, green candidates, we tend to want to encourage candidates to use a union print shop, um, particularly in the Northeast, which despite the dwindling of the labor union movement, um, is still enough of a union town where people, you know, people who are politically active on the left do look for a union bug on political materials. And so I do encourage people to think about and to use a union print shop where possible. Um, on the other hand, you know, Green Values might also say that you want to use a local printer, you know, a printer in your district, ideally. Um, you know, who uses recycled material and soy ink and all kinds of wonderful stuff. And so... But we have um, a co-op. Uh, yeah, a co-op would be great, right? I mean, there's all kinds of ways. And, you know, as long as you feel like you can justify and explain your choices, you know, go with what you want. Um, you know, we've also... I've seen green, you know, green Party candidates who are using, you know, Kinko's and, and Vistaprint. I would just try to, you know, I would counsel against that unless it's, like, really last minute or a limited run. Um, <clears throat> you want to make sure that it's professional looking. Like I really can't overemphasize this enough. Like just because you're running a grassroots campaign doesn't mean it should look like, you know, somebody just threw it together, um, you know, in a word, you know, in Microsoft Word, right? Like there's like the world is way more visually sophisticated now than it was even five years ago. Um, so please find a person who has the skill set. It doesn't have to be professional. You don't have to pay someone. But I guarantee you, like, there's someone in your volunteering midst who is good at this, um, and let them do it. Um, there's all kinds of great systems out, like things that you can use yourself, like Canva. If you're not familiar with that, Google that website where you can, you know, there's templates and all kinds of things that you where you How do you spell make. it? C-A-N-V-A, so it's like canvas without the S at the end. Um, you know, you can make flyers. You can make social media, um, you know, banners, like all kinds of different things. Um, so, you know, find people who have some skills um, and, and please make it look good. Um, so I'm also reading in the chat box, Andy asks, is it okay to use labor donated? I can print up my leaflets for free at my workplace. Okay, so a couple things about that. So yes, you can say labor donated. Um, my understanding of what that means is like, I didn't pay for this at Kinko's, but I didn't use a union shop either. Like in some ways, I, it's essentially like I, I pilfered this at work, right? Um, or, I, or I have my own printer, like really what it should be is I have my own printer in my house, and this is like a small limited run, 100 copies, and I, you know, I just hit control print and did 100 copies. And so instead of the union bug, you can put in very fine, tiny print at the bottom, labor donated. Um, you know, getting stuff from your work is a little tricky. And so, and I'm, I'm saying this is also as the Green Party treasurer who does FEC reporting. 
and compliance. And, you know, so like it really depends on where you work um, and who you work for. Um, you know, I work at a university. And so theoretically, if I copied stuff at work, it's not labor donated. It's the university donating. And the university doesn't donate to political campaigns. At least they don't knowingly do that. And so just be careful because, like, you know, it's one thing to pill for 50 copies here and 50 copies there. But, like, if you're planning a print run of 5,000 pieces for Election Day, um, that's not something you can probably do at, you know, like that labor donated is not for that type of scale, generally speaking. Um, and just be careful because, you know, technically if you're sort of borrowing air quotes um, from your job, like what is your job a corporation? Is your job a business? Are you as a Green Party candidate accepting donations from that organization? Do they know that they're giving it? You know, like, you know, you can obviously get away with little bits here and there, but um, just please consider that. Um, you want to make sure your stuff is clean and concise, right? Like a handout is not a treatise, right? This isn't the Tom Paine days where we're putting together a pamphlet that is an essay. Um, you know, bullet points, three major ideas, um, maybe four, but I would stop there. Um, you know, direct people to your website if you want them to learn more about your issues. <coughs> You want a nice photo, a professional-looking photo, not a selfie. Um, ideally, you know, you would pay for color because these days that's kind of expected. Um, you know, you don't have to, but just keep in mind, you know, how does that photo look when you print it if you're printing it in black and white? Um, you know, make sure that it's, your name is really big and visible. Um, and Jay just put in the chat box a link to his handout, so that's great. Let's all take a look at it. Um, whoops, let's see. Oh, I don't have an Instagram account, so I saw it for about 30 seconds and then it popped away. But um, those of you that do, um, you know, the, I literally saw it for like a second and it, I saw Jay Walker. So like that's good, right? You want to see the name of the candidate. You want, you know, so people do not read. Like, let me say that again. People do not read. How many times have you sent an email in, with instruct, detailed instructions on what to do, and then nobody follows it, right? Because people just don't have the patience anymore to actually read and follow instructions. And so, you know, again, don't write a whole paragraph of stuff. Make sure your name really pops, you know, the office and election day, like November 6th. <laughs> Um, please, of course, you know, I would encourage to make sure that the Green Party is mentioned somewhere on your material. Um, one of the sort of subtle ways to signal that you're green is, of course, to use, like, green um, font, you know, lettering or put it on green paper. Um, you don't have to do that, but it would be nice to make sure that you mention the Green Party or you can say endorsed by the Green Party, running as a Green, Green Party candidate, whatever. Um, you know, especially if your goal is to build the Green Party, it, it only does that if people actually know that you are a Green. Um, so just really make sure that other people take a look. Oh, good, he's now posting it to Facebook so that I can see it. Um, make sure that, you know, get a few eyeballs on this so that it looks good before you get it printed times 10,000. <coughs> At the same right. – oh, um, yes. I can see I, it now, yeah. Yeah, it looks really good. Um, yeah, I mean, this is nice. Like, you know, Walker is really bold. Um, it clearly looks great in black and white. You know, I like how it's, like, offset against the background. Um, you know, make your voice heard. Vote for change now. Like, that's, that's good. There's, you know, here's some bullet points, right? It's the paragraph of what he really thinks is on the back. So for the people who actually care, it's there. But... It's this, you know, it's not these two things together. It's this is the visual, like, quick grab. I see that union bug, yay. Um, he's got his social media. Like, this looks really nice. And, Jay, was this professionally designed? Did you, like, pay someone who's done this before to do this for you? Or did you just have somebody who, like, is handy with some graphic design and whip this up for you? 
Donated by a professional designer. Very nice. Um, know that technically, which this is totally fine, um, that should be considered an in-kind campaign contribution. If someone volunteers, like if I designed a flyer because I'm not a professional volunteer, I mean a professional designer, that's just a volunteer doing something. But if I'm donating what my professional skill set is, what I would normally get paid to do, um, then that's considered an in-kind donation. So just FYI. Um, okay, so I'm going to go back. And I have some other, let's see, we have this thing, like a folder called Campaign in a Box that is not really ready for prime time, um, which is why we haven't really pushed it out. But what we've been trying to do is collect and hopefully people are still seeing my screen, um, sample stuff from campaigns and candidates all over the country. Um, and so like literature signage, and I'm pretty sure some of it, Jewels for Judge was a campaign I worked on last year running statewide in Pennsylvania. And he had some really good stuff that, again, was mostly made by, it was a volunteer who I think, she might be a graphic designer as her paid job. I, I got the sense that she, like, did it but not necessarily um, as a career. But anyway, this was, like, you know, very clean and simple for a lawn sign. You're not putting, you know, people are literally driving by or they're walking by. They're not necessarily reading a ton. Um, the other thing I want to make sure, and, ever, again, every state is different about what's legally required, but this little tiny fine print at the bottom paid for by Mermelstein for Judge, Robert J. Gushu, the third treasurer. Um, make sure you know what legally needs to be on your signage and on your printed material so that you don't get in trouble. I had worked on a campaign where literally on election day we were running around with pens handwriting these disclaimers on because somebody forgot to do it, um, and the other side was taking us to court and demanding that we take all our signage down. And luckily, we were allowed to handwrite it on instead. Um, you don't want to be doing that. That's like really immature. Um, and not immature, but um, unprofessional. Amateur, that's the word I was looking for. Um, you know, the other thing is like to the extent that you're able, customize stuff, right? So in Pennsylvania, there's a big cannabis festival every year. It probably, I think it happens in September. So it probably happened a couple weeks ago. Um, you know, that campaign made um, material just for that audience, just for that day. And so this might have been a small run. Um, but, you know, this is like knowing your audience. What do they care about? Um, and so, um, you know, just know that this, I think, was something like once we knew his ballot position, so this might be the type of thing that you do more in a get out the vote kind of time frame when people are like really thinking about the actual election. Um, I'm pretty sure she did a lot of these on Canva. I'm not 100% sure. Um, we had this hashtag going throughout the campaign. You know, try to be consistent in terms of your visual, like, um, you know, just the way things look so that people recognize, oh, like that's part of that campaign. Um, you know, obviously you can do little one-off things for house parties and events. Um, I'm not really sure what this one was used for, but, um, oh, for I think we had like a kickoff. Um, so just, you know, know that there's different kinds of flyers and materials. Um, here's a door hanger. Let's see if that one has the cutout. I can't remember. Um, you know, so this is what this looked like, and I think this space is sort of intentionally blank up at the top because that's where the print shop will like basically punch that hole so you can you know, put it on someone's door. Um, so there you go. Um, all right. Um, let's see, go back into present mode. And I also wanted to check the comment box since I saw there were a couple more comments. Um, great. So we've got other David Baker. Let's see what you've got. Um, oh. That was an error, so maybe try sending that link again. Um, Andy, here's what he's got. All right, so Andy, my first thing is that this is a lot of text. And so I would say, you know, and your photo is kind of a little dark. Um, so I would definitely, you know, 
try to punch this up and get someone who, you know, has a little more like visual design sense. So someone not like me, for example, to kind of, um, you know, take this and, you know, take these like lot paragraphs that people aren't necessarily going to read and turn them into sort of, you know, shorter like bullet points or concise things. Um, and you def definitely don't necessarily need to have your bio on a flyer. Um, that's the kind of stuff that can go on your website and people who seem interested in what you're doing, you know, then they're going to go check out your bio um, by looking at your website. You want to kind of hook them in and say, come back for more. Um, you can't do it all in one handout. So like this, I do really like Jay. So Jay, thank you for sharing that. Um, and kudos to your volunteer graphic designer. And if they want to do more volunteer work for other greens across the country, let me know. Um, okay, so let's move on because it's already 9.50 and I want to make sure we get into some discussion. Um, so one other thing to think about, and again, <laughs> you can do this throughout the campaign, is you know you want to focus on issues, right? Like why is it that you're running for office? And in the Green Party, it's clearly about the issues, not because like, you're the most attractive candidate in the, you know, in the race, so I'm, you know, you might be. Um, but then you really want to also, like, you have some language that moves people to action. So, like, now, like, what, so what, now what, right? Like, what is you? You're the candidate. This is what, like, I'm happy. This election is happening. So what? Because people need more jobs. The parks are unclean. The schools are in disrepair. Whatever, you know, like, why does this matter? And now what? Go vote. Tell your friend. Donate to my campaign. Like it on social media. You know, like some sort of call to action. Um, so just um, think about that as well. Um, and it's not just for printed materials. This, you know, really, um, I think that what, so what, now what applies to phone banking scripts, to door-to-door -door canvassing scripts. Um, you know, the essential role for between from now until Election Day is mobilizing voters to reach the voters, you know, like, mo sorry, mobilizing volunteers to reach more voters. You yourself cannot do everything. You shouldn't even try. You know, if you're the candidate, you should be, basically, you should be fundraising every day. Really, that's what you should be doing. And your people, your volunteers, if you actually have paid staff, hallelujah, but assuming you don't, everyone around your core team should be out there doing the work for you and recruiting more volunteers who can then extend and do even more work. And so the goal is to reach as many voters as possible to make sure that they know about you and that they want, and then to convince them that they want to vote for you. And so, um, and I've seen this done, sometimes it's fours and fives, sometimes it's ones and twos. It doesn't really matter as long as you know which end of the spectrum is which. But when you're door knocking or phone banking or whatever, you know, if you have a tight field operation, you are going to be tr talking to, you know, you're going to have a street list that says, hey, there's a registered voter in this household. His name is Bob Hope. You know, you talk to Bob Hope. Bob Hope loves Jay Walker, thinks Jay Walker is the greatest thing on earth and is totally going to vote for him. Fabulous. He's a five. Move on. You know, the goal is to sort of, is basically to rate people and get a sense, like, and next door to Bob Hope lives Bing Crosby. And Bing Crosby hates Jay Walker and is like a dyed-in-the-wool Republican and would never vote green if his mother's life depended on it. Well, he's like a zero or a one. And you don't know this until you ask, until you present the candidate and you try to, you know, suss it out. You know, and a lot of people it's going to be, well, three. Like they're just not, you know, telling you or they don't answer the door or whatever. But the goal is to identify as many fours and fives, as many people who are excited about your candidate, who are favorite or, or leaning towards your candidate. And then when you get back to that last few days of get out the vote, you're reminding your fours and fives to go vote. Um, you're not reminding the ones and twos to go vote. You don't care if they vote. Um, you're, in this stage, you're identifying your base. You're building your base. In the get out the vote phase, you're mobilizing them and reminding them to actually go vote on election day. And so right now, it's about just making as many contacts as possible. Um, 
Jay, because he's in my state, um, I, we were on a call last weekend at our state, um, our state committee meeting, and he was showing off a new website that I hadn't seen. And I almost was going to include it today because it looked really cool, though it was pretty expensive. Um, it was, it was, he's paying $99 a month, but it's this really slick um, system that I've already forgotten the name. So, Jay, if you're still on the call, please type it in the chat, the chat box. Um, but it was basically like a mobile app where he has like uploaded the voter. We have like all the voting, his, the, you know, the voter rolls for our state or for his district. He's uploaded it into this system. Your victory guide. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So it's not a total sales pitch yet. Um, but nonetheless, it's like people have an app on their phone. They get like a territory they get, a, you know, basically a walk list. They can record these fours and fives in the app. So, like, that's super sophisticated, and I, quite frankly, I've never worked with a Green Party campaign that's doing it at that level. Um, you don't necessarily need to pay $99 a month for that kind of thing. You can cobble it together with, like, Excel spreadsheets and paper, um, you know, and even people's phones with, like, a Google spreadsheet. But the point is you want to be – trying to knock on the doors or phone call or meet people who are actually registered voters um, and find out, you know, make sure they know about your campaign. They are somewhat convinced, you know, you leave behind a piece of, you know, of, of information. And you want to have an actual conversation, though. You don't want to just, you know, lit drop and blanket a neighborhood. You want to identify who those potential voters are and ideally, you know, if you had a super big time campaign and you knew you needed 10,000 votes to win, the goal would be to find 10,000 fours and fives. And so I'm not saying all this to get people freaked out like, oh, God, I haven't been doing that. There's only six weeks to go. I can't possibly do that. But, you know, do what you can. You know, start, again, target. Um, you're probably not going to cover your entire district, but with the few volunteers that you have, you know, start like from now on to election day, say every Saturday we're going to go out and we're going to door knock a new piece of territory. Um, you know, even if it's only three blocks, get people in a regular habit of going out and campaigning. Like we're going to meet at this coffee shop. We're going to get our pep talk, distribute our materials. Here's everyone's walk list. And like, go do it. Come back in two hours. Let's debrief and then get ready, you know, and then do it again the next weekend. So even if you don't have 20 volunteers going door to door around the clock, you know, get some something is better than nothing. Um, more is more in this case. Um, and so, so my recommendation would be, you know, get something started if you haven't already on the weekends. You know, this is what in sort of traditional political parlance is called the ground war. Um, the air war would be like advertising, you know, television ads, all that type of stuff where it's, you know, it's a crude, crass, you know, non, um, non-peace related metaphor. Sorry, Green Party. Um, but, you know, the, the air war is very disparate. You know, like an ad goes on ABC News and thousands of people may see it who don't even live in your district, right? It's kind of a very, um, you know, it's not very targeted. The ground war is that targeted, you know, it's troops on the ground knocking door to door, calling, um, really doing, you know, direct voter contact. Um, typically in the Green Party, we don't have the bucks for the air war. Like, we don't have the, the money to be on TV. And so this, this is the, you know, the shoe leather express, so to speak, of getting out and going door to door. Um, and then the other thing is, like, you know, maybe every Saturday you're getting, doing door to door. Maybe every Wednesday night you're doing a phone banking night and you've got some call scripts. There are sophisticated phone banking software out there, but you can also just, like, have an Excel spreadsheet or a Google sheet and, you know, phone numbers and everyone work off that, and it works, it works fine. <clears throat> All right, last couple of slides here. Um, put voter mobilization events on your website. Make your campaign look active, like stuff is happening. Literally, last night, the CCC met, and we were debating on who to give money to, and I pulled up somebody's website, and there's an events button, and I clicked on events, and it says nothing new at this time. 
And I'm like, man, it's six weeks to election day. What are you missing me with this time? Like, surely some, you have something planned. You know, I didn't need to see every single week or, you know, like, but nothing like, hmm, that tells me your campaign is not really all that active. And do I really want to give money to you? Probably not. Um, so, you know, if you're doing phone banking, if you're doing door knocking, you know, put it on your website. Show potential volunteers that stuff is going on um, and, you know, you know, help it make it look like a thing. Um, Jay just typed in the chat box, is it too late to get money from the CCC? Unfortunately, yes, it is. Um, applications, I think, were due to us September 12th, and we met last week and again this week to make decisions. Um, you know, and that said, we had all of $2,400 to give away as a national party, which is kind of sad, actually. Um, so if you're running any kind of real decent campaign, you're going to be raising money. You don't need, like, we basically gave some candidates $100, some candidates 200 which is great, you know, for many candidates, that is a big boost. But, um, you know, we're just, we're not yet at the place we want to be in terms of the amount of money we're bringing in at the national party level. Um, all right, so make your campaign look active. It tells people how to get involved. Think about also developing leadership among your volunteers, deputizing people. You know, can they be precinct captains or team leaders? Like, can so-and-so be the go-to person for, you know, the door knocking in this neighborhood or for these Saturday events, that type of thing? And then, you know, those people, they'll cultivate them now. They will probably also be your Election Day volunteers who are going to work the polls on Election Day. Or do it in reverse. If you have a list of people who have already said, I'm willing to do Election Day, say, great, can you come out now? to help, you know, door knock in your neighborhood so that when those people come to the polls on election day, they're not seeing you for the first time. You know, you've already interacted with them. So, you know, we have a guy here in Philadelphia, um, Chris Robinson, who said he was going to be on the call but isn't, but that's all right. So I, I will talk about him in his absence. Um, and we have crunched the numbers. Chris's division consistently has the highest Green Party vote of any division in the city. And I don't think it's that he lives in, like, the most progressive, greenest area. I mean, it's decent, right? Like, he's, he's living in an area that's friendly to the Green Party. But I think the real secret to Chris's success is that he is at his poll every single election, primary and general. Twice a year, he is out there. And people, at this point, people just know him. Like, they walk, they're like, hey, Chris, what's the Green Party doing this year? And so he's like a fixture in his community and at the polling place. And it's like he, like he's, our, you know, in some ways his existence is advertising for us. And so, you know, I think the long game here for the Green Party, at least in places that are traditional Northeast, you know, no early voting election day kind of places, um, you know, it's really about getting people to be that visible presence at their polling place, develop those relationships, knock on people's doors during the year. You know, they shouldn't only see you on Election Day. Um, you know, they should be seeing you year-round. So that is kind of it, I think. Um, I, you know, my last slide is just what else? Like, what other things have people done? This is the chance for you to toot your own horn. Um, if you've done something really, you know, interesting, let us know. Um, thanks for the people who already shared their materials. I'm going to see what else is going on in the chat box. And um, Dave Stack. That's it. Great. Dave, question, comment. Okay. What's up? Yeah, well, um, I'm sneaking up on retirement age, and I've been campaigning and canvassing since I was in junior high. And I just want to say that the recipe or this presentation that Hillary just gave is 100% spot on. It's what works. And I just wanted to add a couple things and, and brag a little bit. I was in, living in Virginia, and I was in the ballroom on the day that Marshall Coleman conceded to L. Douglas Wilder, the grandson of a slave in Richmond, Virginia, announced that he was the next governor of Virginia, and I worked on that campaign, and I made a difference because I was with the Sierra Club that hosted a debate 
that was one of the turning points, and it was a very close race, uh, about 5% um, tip, tipped it over in, in, in for a big win. But I also wanted to say that every vote is a win, and every campaign is a win. Um, and what we're doing here in Ohio is also trying not only this election, but we're reaching out to the new, young, first-time voters and the disenfranchised voters. So 65% of voters don't show up for the polls. That's our target. And we're talking to 16-year-olds, 14-year-olds, and 13-year-olds because they'll be voting in 2020, 20, 2020, 2022. And actually, Constance Goodell Newton, who was instrumental in getting Green Party access ballot access in Ohio now is running for governor and our party is growing uh, geometrically. We're getting where we had kind of a slow start for the last two years. We're getting 100 volunteers a week, 200 uh, some weeks and um, we're having uh, Jill Stein is coming through Ohio. She's going to be here next week at Kent State University on Tuesday uh, in the afternoon, Columbus in the evening. Uh, next afternoon down in Cincinnati for a luncheon. That's We're great. riding on the coattail. And one, one other thing I wanted to add, too, with, with, um, with cell phones and Internet, you can work on other campaigns. I uh, was volunteering, and I'm a volunteer. I haven't had much time to do it uh, uh, this, uh, this cycle, but Ma Kenneth Mejia's last campaign, in uh, Los Angeles, I was able to, with the time zone difference, uh, at bedtime I could spend an hour on the phone and make phone calls and canvas for the candidate in uh, California. Same thing with um, the governor's race in New Jersey too. So, so you know, reach out, reach out to everybody uh, around the country, anybody that's that that you can pull in, because like I say, every every vote counts and every vote is a win. So. Um, that's that, that's pretty much my speech, and I could ramble a little bit more, but those were the points I wanted to make. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much, Dave. I just wanted to bring up something. Uh, I had worked uh, for Jill Stein's campaign for governor here in Massachusetts and when she was running for president, and in both cases uh, our largest events were not – something that was generated by the Green Party. In, in one case, it was uh, it was cannabis activists to, to, to come up with the largest Jill Stein event. And in another case, it was the International Socialist Organization. And in both cases, it was at the university. So uh, uh, students can, can, be, uh, can be brought to, to, to show their interest uh, but uh, it, it, it's it's not you know, it's not what you might think on uh, on first perusal. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Other comments, questions. We didn't really cover, admittedly, about yeah, sorry, how to who, talk who to the voters. Sorry, who was the guy that the guy from Massachusetts that just spoke? Could, could you That's elaborate me, a little bit B. at the end? Of, yeah, could, could you say a little bit more about what you? I didn't catch the last part about the students. Well, uh, one thing that we did was a. Uh, uh, it, it, it was there was like an entertainment thing. Uh, I, 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 I sing poems and act them out, and Jill Stein opened for me. And so, really, of course, people were there to see Jill Stein, but to uh, get it into the student activities, uh, they didn't know Jill Stein, but they knew me, and so, uh, so we we were able to uh, to do that with the cannabis activists. And then most recently, when she was running for president, the, the International Socialist Organization there has a lot of students and, uh, and community members. And uh, they, they were very friendly to, the, to Jill Stein. It was, I think it was probably her biggest event in Massachusetts was with the International Socialist Organization at the university. Oh, cool. So like yeah. Rock the Vote and stuff like that. So she, yeah, I got it. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think the other point there is that, you know, look beyond the Green Party for your volunteer base, right? Um, right. You know, generally yeah. speaking, candidates and campaigns generate way more buzz and interest than the party itself, right? 
Um, so I use this metaphor all the time, like, you know, being a Green Party activist is like running a marathon and being a, on a campaign is like a sprint, right? So campaigns are way more intense. There's like this targeted sense of urgency, like it's all about Election Day, November 6th, you know, like bust your ass and crank out one more press release, do one more thing because like it's all or nothing for this one day, whereas the party itself is kind of, you know, like – there's, there's always going to be another press release to write. There's always another, you know, it's just like this never-ending thing, right? It's year-round. Um, and so in my experience, people just tend to be more interested in the sprint than in the marathon. Um, there's just something, I don't know if it's the psychology of, like, a competition and winning or what, but, you know, people get interested in well-run candidates and campaigns more so than they typically do in the party. And so – you know, you got to well, harness that and you got to build like it's an it's an opportunity to build the party, bring new people in that aren't already in the choir, you know, reach out to those other organizations, to student groups. If a campaign does not have enough momentum to sort of bring in new people beyond, you know, the usual suspects who are already sort of toiling away for the party, then it's not really going to go anywhere because, you know, those usual suspects are keeping the party going. The party stuff still has to happen even while the campaign is happening. And so, you know, that's something I think that we often struggle with because there's just not enough people to go around. Um, but we really, you know, we yeah, really yeah, have more to thing. look beyond the party to staff our campaigns. Yeah. Yeah, one more thing. Yeah, the, 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 the victory party on Election Day is the start of the next campaign. Yeah, that's a good, you know, sure. Get people talking, get people, you know, get people to feel good about what they did um, and to feel like, you know, they're part of this larger thing because they're looking around the room and there's 20 other people who are all doing the same stuff they did. Um, you know, depending on what your role in a campaign is, it can be isolating. Like if you just made phone calls from your own home, it's hard to get that, that feeling you know, most of the time we don't have the resources to have, like, you know, a real campaign office that, you know, is open, you know, 12 hours a day where you go in and there's buzz and, you know, stuff that you might see in the movies. Like, we've had that a couple of times, but we don't have that on a regular basis. And so it's hard to to see sort of the depth and breadth of what has gone on. And one one small way to do that is that sort of election night gathering. All right. And that, um, that, of course, builds uh, long-lasting solidarity because uh, mm -hmm. these people are yep. are, uh, are uh, enthused to to have been part of it, uh, and they do look at it as a victory party, even though, of course, it's often not an actual victory. Yeah. Right. Exactly. All right. Any other final thoughts or comments? I just want to thank you, uh, Hillary. It's really good. I appreciate it. Lots of good information. And, no problem. Um, yeah, look forward to trying to enact some of this stuff. Great. Yeah, thank you, Hillary. You did a great job. You're my hero. Oh. <laughs> Jay well says, done. Ralph Nader had a really awesome event for, awesome idea for an election night event. What was it? I am not familiar. Um. I don't know. All right. So um, thank you all. We want to raise all. a lot more money for the next time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and also, I mean, look, we have time goes just on. to sort of, um, you know, the, just to let you know what's coming down the pike, you know, October we typically do a get out the vote call. Um, so I don't know when we're going to be able to pull that off. Like, ideally we should do it um, kind of like in two weeks um, just to give people time to actually plan. Um and then in November, our call is debriefing your run. So after everyone's, you know, has, has had a moment to breathe, you want to take a step back and, like, reflect. What did you actually learn? What could you have done better? Take some notes, pass them on to the next person or to yourself if you hope, you know, run again. Um, so just know that, you know, this is the time of the year where it's very sort of – the webinars are very timed with what's actually happening in the calendar. 
So that's it. All right, I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you all. And um, Thank you the, very the other much. thing I want to say is um, the recording will go on. So GP, here, I'm, just, I'm going to share my screen again for two more seconds. Um, so gpus.org, not gp.org, is our internal website that's meant more for those of us who are active in the party. And if you go to committees, it's a very slow site. And then you scroll down to the Coordinated Campaign Committee. This is where we archive in webinars here, um, where we archive all the, call, the calls. And so there's definitely some really good calls that have happened before. If you want to see a video of me doing Running for Office 101, that's here too. <coughs> um, but things I mentioned, <coughs> voter targeting is here. Um, you know, other types of topics. So this one will go up shortly. And um, that's about it. Excellent. Thanks very much. All Thank right. You. Good night, everyone. I appreciate this. Good night, folks. Good night. Get out the vote. Good night.